Good evening, everyone. How are you doing? I'm very tired. I was in New York this morning speaking to about 40 companies on these issues, and I've been working with organizations like uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers and Disney and, uh, and some tech company over the, over the last few weeks, and now I get to be here at the University of Michigan. Uh, you're all doing good work on, the, on this area of diversity, equity, and inclusion. You're off to a good start. So I'm here to hopefully help out with that. Um, I'm tired, I, I, I look outside, and my son is right there, he's a Michigan senior here, so I'm, I'm practicing what I preach around open-mindedness and inclusion. I'm a Michigan State guy, but I, I, we sent him to Michigan, right, right, okay. So um, I'm a little tired, you look a little tired out, out there, so I need to wake your brains up. Uh, I used to be a professor b before, and I'd have these 8 o'clock morning classes where students would come in kind of sleepy, uh, and I thought I had something to, uh, good to give them. And I wanted to get their, their money, them to get their money's worth, so I, I had to wake their brains up to get their synapses firing, their neurons going online, so they could process all the information I was going to give them. So um, I learned a little trick, and I'm going to use that little trick on you to wake your brains up so you can process the information I'm going to give you. I just gave them a simple math problem. Okay? So I'm going to give you a simple math problem just to wake your brains up. For those of you who are mathophobic, do not worry. It's very easy. It's simple addition. I'm going to give you a series of numbers to add up. Add them up silently in your head. Don't do it on a piece of paper. Don't do it on your phone. Do it silently in your head. And then when I call out for the answer, yell it out really loudly for all the people around you to hear how smart you are. <laughs> because if there's ever going to be a time you're going to get a math problem right, this is the time. It's that easy, OK? Now, this is just to wake our brains up so we can process some of this information uh, that I'm going to give you, OK? So again, do it in your head until I call out for the answer. Then just yell out really loudly. Got it? All right, so begin with the number 1,000. Okay, just do it silently. Begin with the number 1,000. To that 1,000, add 40. Add another 1,000. Add 30. Add another 1,000. Add 20. Add another 1,000. Add 10. What's the answer? All right, 5,000. That tells me your brain is working. Yeah, let's just see if your brain is working correctly. Before I had you add 10, you arrived at 4,090. Is that not right? What's 4,090 plus 10? 0 plus 0 is 0. 9 plus 1 is 10. And carry the 1 hour is 40 to 100. Many of you suck at math, right? I just read that Michigan was the number one public university in the nation. Maybe not at math, right? How did you get this wrong? How did you get this wrong? Is this a particularly hard math problem? I hope you don't think so. But how did you get this wrong? And, and once we figure out how you got it wrong, we're going to see one of the underlying cognitive reasons why we tend to make mistakes on a regular basis. Uh, mistakes around math problems, mistakes around relational issues, mistakes around leadership issues, mistakes around how parents go to their kids' sporting events and yell at the refs, which is really good role modeling, right, Nicholas? I used to yell at the refs at his game. So, uh, so how did you get this wrong? Talk to me. How did you get this wrong? And, and, and once you figure out how, how you got it wrong, again, uh, we're going to see some things that lead us to maybe not be inclusive as we'd like to be. Okay. What does this illustrate about your brain? What does your brain love? Shortcuts and patterns, exactly. They love shortcuts and patterns. In fact, uh, we're going to go with uh, the, the answer I was looking for was patterns, but the gentleman up here said shortcuts. Your brain loves shortcuts, right? In fact, uh, a bias uh, to a cognitive neuroscientist, a bias is just a cognitive shortcut the brain takes to conserve energy, to get th things done very quickly. We'll, we'll touch upon that a little later. But, uh, so your brain loves patterns. Your brain loves patterns. Your brain loves patterns so much we'll find a pattern where a pattern does not exist. Why? Well, the easy answer is because your brain is lazy. <laughs> your brain is lazy. Or put more positively, your brain is efficient. Your brain is always trying to conserve energy, right? Uh, so let me kind of introduce a couple of simple terms that I will use to describe the human brain uh, as we go through this talk. Uh, there will be helpful terms for us. But to understand these, the simple, the simple terms I'm using um, are trying to describe a very complex thing called the human brain. It's much more complex than this, but the terms we'll be using will help us to understand kind of what's going on. You started that math problem out using what I call your modern brain. 
Your modern brain was designed to do those types of math calculations. It was designed to think through things, to analyze things. It can do this thing called metacognition. Do you know what metacognition is, you psychology folks out there? Yeah, it's, it's the ability to think about thinking. It's something that humans can do that other animals cannot do. It, it, it kind of means this. We can imagine things before they occur and evaluate them. We can think about our own thinking, right? So you start that math problem out using this modern brain that can do those types of things, analyze, imagine, think through, metacognition, right? But once your brain found a pattern, it locked onto it. And once your brain locks onto a pattern, in a sense, you stop critically thinking. You move into what I call your ancient brain. Your ancient brain was not designed to do those calculations. It was not designed to think through things, not designed to analyze things before it responds. It was just designed to quickly react to things without thinking, to quickly respond to things using past experiences without thinking. Does that make sense? It doesn't mean your ancient brain is bad just because it got the math problem wrong. It just means it was designed for different purposes, right? You put your ancient brain in a situation it was designed for, it operates very well for you. A situation like Major League Baseball. A Major League Baseball player, hitter, could not hit a 90 mile per hour fastball if they used their modern brain. It takes about 0.4 seconds for a 90 mile per hour fastball to reach the plate from the mound, right? Human reaction time to visual data is about 0.25 seconds. So in a span of 0.15 seconds, the Major League Baseball hitter has to pick up the ball in physical space, make very complex mathematical calculations about where the ball will be over the plate, and also during that 0.15 second time frame, has to mobilize parts of the bodies to move a bat to meet the ball in physical space. If the ba baseball player used their modern brain to do that, they would never get a hit. The ball would already be in the, pitcher's, in the catcher's glove before they even thought about hitting. Does that make sense? So it's not your ancient brain is bad just because it got the math problem right. It was just designed for different purposes. Now, we live in a very modern world where our, brain, our uh, society asks us to use our modern brain more, to think through things, to analyze things. The problem is this. Research suggests what? Our, of your waking hours, guess what percentage of the time you spend in your ancient brain? Any guesses? About 70 to 80% of the time you spend in your ancient brain, which is not necessarily bad. Your brain, your ancient brain can do lots of things for you that helps you to be efficient. If you used your modern brain to walk across the room, it would take you a very long time because you'd have to think about picking your leg up and putting it down, put it, picking your leg up, putting it down, and that would not be very fast or efficient. So, so your ancient brain is not so bad. Again, the problem though is, we, we're, we live in a modern world that asks us to use our modern brain more, and that can lead to issues. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay, so let's take the word patterns. Let's take the word patterns, put the word people in front of it, and you have these things called, well, people patterns. You might think of people patterns as stereotypes. I, as a scientist, tend not to use the word stereotype because it has a negative connotation at times. So I, I use the word, men, uh, the, uh, the term mental model or mental models. But if I use mental models, people patterns, or stereotypes, think of them as kind of synonymous for our purposes tonight. Our brain builds mental models of lots of things. It builds mental models of, uh, of environments, of physical environments. It builds mental models of people within those environments. It builds mental models of ideas that people have within those environments. And what does our brain use mental models for? To quickly respond and quickly react and quickly judge and quickly evaluate, right? Without thinking, right? And here's the deal. The ability to quickly judge, quickly evaluate, quickly respond does not guarantee that we'll do it well. Just because we can do it doesn't mean we do it well. A lot of it depends on what's contained, the information contained in the mental model, the people pattern, and the time between stimulus and response. How much time do you give yourself to think through an uh, uh, a situation? Uh, do you give yourself uh, options using your modern brain to, to think about it from different perspectives, or do you just react in a singular way with your ancient brain? Okay. Um, I'm going to talk more about mental models, so I, so I need to get a few out of the way that might be running in your head about me. Uh, first of all, I don't know karate or any other martial art. I and my family have never owned a laundromat, uh, never been involved in the restaurant business. Ladies, I can't do your nails for you. Guys, I can't tailor your clothes. We don't have a ping pong table at home, but I'm very good at math. I own a lot of cameras. I'm actually a very good driver. 
How many of you recognize most, if not all, of those Asian mental models and so-called stereotypes, right? Yeah, so I don't do that just for fun. I do it for a reason to show you something. When you recognize those Asian stereotypes or mental models, what's one simple thing that tells me about you? In fact, what's one simple thing that tells you about you when you recognize those Asian stereotypes and mental models? The simple thing it should tell you is this. You have them in your head. Because if you didn't have them in your head, you would have responded this way. You would have gone, hmm, what's he talking about? I don't understand. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense to me. Why are other people around me giggling and laughing? It, it, it doesn't make sense. But you got it to some degree, right? It resonated with you at some level. It should tell you that you have them in your head. Then once you figure out and understand that you have them in your head, the next question might be, especially if you're a neuroscientist who studies mental models, the next question might be this, how'd they get there? How did those Asian mental models get in your head? How many of you had to work really, really hard to get them into your head? How many of you logged on to Amazon.com one evening and ordered the Asian stereotype guidebook for dummies? Wait for it to arrive at your home and start studying Asian stereotypes as if you were cramming for a college exam. How have you had to do that to get Asian mental models in your head? I hope none of you. You don't have to. All you have to do, all I have to do, because I have the same ones you do, all we have to do is live in an environment that gives us limited, narrow messages about people that we call Asians. Our brain absorbs those messages and creates mental models for us without asking our permission. It does it out of our awareness, right? Um, it, it, it absorbs those messages and creates mental models in the same way we absorb lyrics of a song. All of us know words to songs, right? How did you get those words into your head? Just listen to the songs over and over and over, right? But think about this. When you heard the songs in the past, did you have to pay careful attention every single time and tell yourself to remember the words? Did you have to work really hard at getting those words into your head? Uh, maybe if you're in choir class, but many of the songs you have in your head, they just got there, right? When you were driving down the road in a car and you heard a song that you wanted to remember, did you pull over your car and say, I need to remember, ah, 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 ah. <laughs> Staying alive, do you have to do that? No, the Bee Gees got in your head without you even knowing. That's a scary thought, isn't it? You know what's scarier, at least for me? Justin Bieber's there, too. <laughs> we don't always get to edit, gatekeep, and control the stuff that gets into our head. And because we don't always get to edit, gatekeep, and control the stuff that gets into our head, um, do you think there's stuff in your head that you don't agree with? Do you think there's stuff in your head that uh, you don't want in your head? I love this. I love what they're doing. Because the United States is a, is a place where protests can happen. You know, I used to, I used to um, protest when I was young. Um, and the, the thing that I didn't like when I protested was no one would hear my voice. So for those of you who are protesting, I, I invite you to come up and tell us what you're protesting about. Because I want to know. So come on up. One, uh, one or both? Yeah, come on up. Yeah, come on up, because where, where are the t-shirts? It says, many, many voices are Michigan. I want to hear the voice. I want to hear the voice. Come on up. You're like the Colin Kaepernick of this, of diversity. I love this. So talk, talk to me. What, 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 yeah. Because I think it's important that people hear your voice, just like you're allowing people in the audience to hear my voice. What, just, yeah, just. Just real quickly. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Rick Grant. Um, one of the reasons that we're here is to talk about how the administration refuses to acknowledge valid threats to people's lives at this university. And we were here and we wanted to see what this space looked like and we wanted to engage with this space and engage people's attention to the fact that the administration has continued to silence our voices when we have reported those things to the administration, and we have also talked about it in many different avenues, but have not been heard. Cool, cool, all right. Is, is, does that represent all of you? Okay, go ahead. And if you want, you can stay on stage uh, with me and, and, and do that. Uh, if you want, you can go sit down, but I, I, I hear you, I hear you. Okay, so if you can stay on stage, I just ask that you sit down, because I'm gonna tell a story that you're gonna want. You, you wanna say something really quickly? I just wanted to also, 
add that we decided to do this particular event of, with the DEI because it was scheduled on the day that we all have class and we could not be there. Mm -hmm. And also student okay. voices yeah. weren't as inputted yeah. as they should have been in this plan. I hear you, I hear you, all right. So can you do me a favor? You can stay on stage, but just sit down. I want to share a story that, that I think that, that addresses your, your needs, okay? So I, I yeah. Oh, that's, that's fine. For those, no, no, you don't need to sit down there. You can sit up here. You can stay up here. Okay. So um, I, didn't, I, I didn't plan on telling this story till the end, but, but, but I'll tell it now because I think it addresses some of the things that, are, that, that they're feeling, right? Um, and, and it's a message that I wanted to get out anyway. So um, I came to the United States in 1970 when I was five years old from Vietnam. In that year, my mom married an American serviceman there, not necessarily because she loved him, but also so she could take me out of a war-torn country. It was becoming more and more dangerous, and uh, the war was escalating, and my mom felt compelled to take me to a safer place called the United States of America. So she marries this, 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 this military guy. Uh, she loved him, but she saw it also as a way to take me to a safer place. In making the decision to, to take me here, she simultaneously makes the decision to leave her whole family behind. And that pained her a great deal because she couldn't take her mom and dad, aunts and uncles, brothers, cousins, sisters with her. It pained her a great deal because in Vietnamese culture, family means everything. If you were to come to me in Vietnam and you asked, who are you? Uh, my traditional response would be, I am the son of, I am the brother of. I would give you my family name first before I gave you my individual name. The group is more important than the person. If you notice, that's why in many Asian countries, the family name comes first and the individual name comes second, right? Shows priority and values. So it pained her a great deal to leave her family behind. To offset some of that pain and try to give us both hope as we're flying from, the U, from Vietnam to the United States, my mom tries to teach me some things that she had learned about the United States as she was growing up. She tried to teach me some concepts embedded in words that I think all of us are familiar with. Words that sound like these. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creators with certain inalienable rights, that among those rights are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And, and some historians note that when Jefferson penned the words pursuit of happiness, in Jeffersonian times, uh, the pursuit of happiness meant kind of the pursuit of community happiness, not individual happiness as the way we frame it today, right? My mom tries to teach me those concepts. She tried to teach me the place we're going called the United States of America was one of very few places across the globe where you could come with nothing except for the shirt on your back, but end up with something if you worked hard enough. She left out the part about it's good to know people too. Because I think we would all agree that relationships matter, correct? Who you know has, has, a, has an impact on, on where you go in life. And, and here's the re reality of that not everybody has equal access to their same relationships, which means this, not everybody has access to the same types of opportunities. Right? So my mom tries to teach me those things as we fly from Vietnam to the United States. But as soon as we land into Los Angeles International Airport, LAX, we walk off the plane and step into that first building. As we step in that first building, people there begin throwing things at me and my mom. These were not good things. They would spit on us as we walked by. They would yell horrible words at us as we passed by. I didn't understand English at the time, but I knew these were not good words by the way people were yelling them. I remember my mom putting her arms around me, all four foot 11, 95 pounds for this young Vietnamese woman trying to protect her only son from the things that people were throwing at us. As we'd walk along the corridor, sometimes the pelting would become harder and harder. My mom would instinctively squeeze tighter and tighter, and sometimes she would squeeze so tightly that it would hurt. On those occasions, I'd look up, I'd want to say something to my mom, but I never did, because every time I looked up, all I saw was tears streaming down her face. And even as a little five-year-old, I knew I should be silent at the time. We weren't treated very well when we first arrived in the United States. My mom barely spoke English. I didn't speak English at all. We were the outsiders in people's minds. Uh, we represented a war uh, that people did not want to be in. But you have to understand the context of that time, because context matters. Um, we didn't even treat our Vietnam veterans well when they returned home. 
And imagine if we didn't treat our Vietnam veterans well, imagine what it might be like to be, like to actually be Vietnamese at that time. Right? I grew up in some, some tough neighborhoods when I first arrived in the United States, places you wouldn't want to grow up in, places like Long Beach, Compton, and Bellflower. I'd often get bloodied and beaten in fights I got into at school. On school days, my mom would look outside our second story apartment window to make sure that I was coming home because sometimes in my neighborhood, kids didn't come home ever. On the days that my mom would send me off to school, I remember her just holding on to me and not wanting to let me go. Because for a lot of people in the United States, when you send your kids off to school, it's a safe, happy place. In the neighborhoods I lived in, it wasn't a safe, happy place. Imagine being responsible for the life of a child, and you don't know in what condition it will come home in after school. To make a long story short, the guy that my mom married, my stepfather, um, I was never really close to him. We didn't have much in common but my stepfather got really close to my little sister. In 1984, my stepfather was convicted of raping my little sister. And because of that and the way she was treated as a biracial child in school, half white, half Vietnamese, my sister ran away from home with a friend of hers, an acquaintance of hers, in the summer of 1985. One month after my sister runs away, my mom gets a phone call from a detective in the King County Sheriff's Department, Seattle, Washington. Detective says to my mom, Mrs. Robbins, in so many words, he says this. And Mrs. Robbins, we found the other girl that your daughter ran away with. But that other girl had been sexually assaulted and bludgeoned to death. And as soon as he says that, my mom frantically asks, what about my daughter? What about Diane? What do you know about her? And all the detective, detective could say was, we don't know. There's no trace of your daughter. We don't know. There's no evidence of your daughter. We don't know. There are no leads to follow. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know. All I could say over and over was, we don't know. That was 1985. It's 2016 now, and we still don't know. How many of you have ever heard of a guy by the name of Gary Ridgway, a.k.a. the Green River Killer? My sisters believed to be one of his many victims. He killed more than 100 young women in the Green River area, uh, uh, area of Seattle, Washington in the 80s and 90s. My sisters believed to be one of his many victims. Um, if you go online after this talk, go on Google and put in my sister's name, Diane Robbins, missing children, those keywords, missing children, you'll see my, ki my sister's case file at the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, two pictures of her, one of when she was 12 when she left and one of what she might look like today, computer generated. As you might imagine, after that phone call, life isn't so great for my mom and me, but it's especially bad for my mom because you're not supposed to outlive your children, are you? My mom goes into this deep depression, not many happy days in her life, but there came a time when she was happy at least temporarily. It came in June of 1991. That's when I get married to my wife, Donna, out in Michigan, out in Grand Rapids, Michigan, right? Um, my mom's there for the wedding celebration, and for a week, it's the happiest I'd seen her since that phone call. She was laughing at people's jokes. She was hugging others. It brought great joy to my heart to see her that way. But as you and I know, all good things must come to an end, right? The wedding celebration ends. My mom flies back home to Washington State, where she's living at the time. Goes back into depression. A few months later, just a few months later, in the fall of 1991, I begin graduate school at Michigan State University. I would talk with my mom on the phone every week. We would share with each other the week's events. On this particular phone call in late October 91, we're talking, we're sharing. And as we're about to close, my mom says to me, she says, Long, my Vietnamese name, Long. You have Donna to take care of you now, she says, and we hang up. A week later, I get a phone call from Washington State. I expect it to be my mom, but when I pick it up, it turns out to be a detective from the Benton County Sheriff's Department, Kennewick, Washington. And the detective says to me in so many words, Mr. Robbins, we have some unfortunate news. 
we just found your mom and she was hanging in her shower a month, a week after my mom says to me, Long, you have Donna to take care of you now. My mom takes her own life. I imagine a big reason why was my sister, but also the way she was treated as an invisible outsider in the United States of America. And I imagine this is what some of the kids are thinking here tonight, too. So that's why I want them on stage with me. Right? When she found someone, my wife, to take me the rest of the way, there was nothing left in her to give. If there was anything that was good that came out of my mom's suicide, it might be this. It happened the first semester of graduate school for me. It's that one single incident alone that led me to study what I studied in graduate school, which we'll touch upon after the story here, about how, how we pe treat people that we call outsiders, how we, how we tend to, to flock with people like our own and don't think about others who are different than us very positively at times, right? Um, it's that one single incident alone that leads me to do the work I do today. I do this work that people call diversity and inclusion um, to honor my mom and my little sister and to try to create a better world for my Nicholas and his two brothers and sisters, sister. Because I know what can happen in a world where we're not inclusive and open-minded and reach out to outsiders, right? There's pain involved, there's pain involved. I use the word outsider. For me, every diversity issue is an insider outsider issue. Every diversity issue, whether you're talking about race or gender, or you're talking about when I go to NASA, uh, the, the insiders are the engineers, the outsiders are everyone else. Right? Insiders and outsiders. Our brain sees people as insiders and outsiders. Our brain, as soon as you walk into a room, as soon as you walk into a room, your brain does this. Have you noticed that? When you walk into a room, your brain scans the room. What, what do you think it's doing? It's trying to figure out who the insiders are and who the outsiders are. Long ago, it was about physical safety. Long ago, it was about scanning an environment to see what was dangerous or not. Today, it's more about social comfort. Who's like me? Who's not like me? Right? So I want to talk about insiders and outsiders a little bit. What's it like to be an outsider? Imagine a time you've been an outsider. In fact, I want you to close your eyes for, with me for a second. Close your eyes. Imagine a time you've been an outsider, whether it was when you were five years old or just five days ago, whether it was you were the new kid in school or the new person on the job. Maybe you visited a foreign country where they didn't speak your language and People didn't understand you. Imagine the time you've been an outsider. Okay, now, open your eyes. Give me some words to describe what you were thinking, what you were feeling when you were the outsider. Just yell it out really loud so I can write it up here. Fear. Discomfort. Yell some more out for me, people. Isolated. Lonely. Shame. What was that last one? Frustrated. Frustrated. What else? Self-conscious. Self Confused. Confused. More. A few more. Less than. Less than. What? What? I still didn't hear. Broken. One more. Hopeless. Hopeless. Yeah, I'll get that one. That one. Whatever you said there. Unwanted. Okay, let me, I ask you to think of a time you were the outsider. And then I ask you what it was like to be an outsider. And you gave me words like fear, discomfort, isolated, lonely, shamed, uh, frustrated, self-conscious, confused, less than, broken, hopeless, unwanted. Let me ask you something. How well do you think you perform under those mental conditions? What do you think? 
probably not as well as you could perform if you were not under those negative mental conditions, correct? So get this, outsiderness has an impact on cognitive and task performance. It has an impact on how well you study, what you remember. It has an impact on how well you do in school. If, if, if that doesn't resonate with you, let me put it this way. How many of you play sports or played sports? How many of you enjoy sports? How many of you live in the United States where we worship sports? <laughs> okay, okay. So um, this, this, you, you'll relate to this. When the football player walks onto the football field, the soccer player walks onto the soccer pitch, the golfer walks onto the golf course, the basketball player walks onto the basketball court, uh, basketball court. How important is their mental state? You athletes, we athletes know it's very important, right? So do you all understand that when these students walk into the class, the employees of U of M walk on into their offices, that is their football field, that is their basketball court, that is their golf course, that is their soccer pitch. If the university, which means also all of you because you make up the university, if all of you aren't doing your part in creating a safe environment for people to operate in, don't expect the University of Michigan to be, again, the top ranked university in the nation. See, you all have a role in it to create a safe place where people can perform optimally. I'm a neuroscientist. One of my area of study is called social neuroscience. The thing we find in social neuroscience that's cool to me is this. The human brain is optimized to perform at its best under two conditions. When it's around other people who care about it. Our brain performs better when it's around other people who care about it. Why is that the case? Why does our brain want to be around other people? Oh yeah, a lot of brain mechanisms that we're talking about got their start on the Serengeti long ago. Why did our ancestors on the Serengeti want to be around other people? For survival, exactly. So if you take the human being, compare us to the rest of the animal kingdom, for our size and weight, we are relatively weak and slow. A chimpanzee half our size is three times as strong as us. And that's not even the strongest of the primates. The gorilla is 15 times stronger than us. You take an ant, you drop it from this height, what will it do? Walk away. You take a human being and, and, and drop us from the equivalent of this height. What will we do? We will not walk away. A fawn is born in the wild. How soon before it begins to walk and run? Within minutes, they'll be walking. Within the hour, they'll be running. How soon before a human baby walks? About a year, right? We parents know that. So understand this. We survived long ago because we operated in tribes. That's still in us today. In fact, it's hardwired in us today. We are hardwired to belong. But have you noticed, you can be part of a tribe, you can be around other people, and also feel very lonely. Being alone and being lonely can be two very different things. You can be around lots of people and feel very lonely, right? Why did our ancestors, why does our brain want to be around other people and have them care about us, value us? Well, take a, take a look at it this way. Um, what happens if you're a part of a tribe long ago, but you're not valued much? At least not valued as much as other people in the tribe. Guess what happens when the tribe starts to run low on food and water? Or if the tribe engages in sacrificial practices? Yeah, you're one of the first to go, okay? So that's hardwired in us today. We want to belong. We want people to care about us. That's when our brain tends to operate at its best. I don't know if you heard it. These students up here, they said we don't feel safe. Right? And I know the president of the university is doing their best. There are some things that you can't share, some things you can't do. You know, um, So I hope that the students also, also understand that, that, that the, the administration is trying to do its best under the conditions of how the university operates. Okay. This is what you told me what it felt like to be an outsider. I want to show you what's happening in your brain, what research at least suggests is happening in your brain when you're an outsider. So um, this is a very bad side view of the human brain. Okay. 
researchers said, we know that the brain is hardwired to belong, so they hypothesize. Something must be happening in the brain when the person doesn't feel like they belong. So they set out to prove that hypothesis, or at least to gather data to suggest that there's some truth to it. So they took some subjects. They had them play a game on a computer screen with two other people. These are UCLA neuroscientists in 2000, I think, too. And uh, everybody was playing it first. So imagine three people on a screen playing a computer, a computer game. It's a simple game called Cyberball. People were throwing the ba a ball back and forth to each other, right? So everybody was playing at first. But somewhere along the line, the researcher told the other two people, don't throw the ball to the subject anymore. Exclude them. Reject them from the game. And when they did that, they noticed something happening in the subject's brain because an fMRI scan was, was being conducted in their brain. So they noticed something happened. Two areas of the brain lit up in this particular research. The two areas, the dorsal anterior cingulate cortex. The second area, the right ventral prefrontal cortex. Those two areas lit up when the person, the subject, was not allowed to play the game anymore when they were included at first. Interestingly enough, these are also the same two areas of the brain that light up when human beings experience physical pain. What we know is their pain centers lit up, but their pain centers did not light up in response to getting slapped in the face or getting kicked in the shin. It was in response to being left out of a computer game in an experiment that they volunteered for. Researchers labeled this phenomenon the social pain of exclusion, the social pain of rejection. You experience outsiderness with those words, fear, lonely, discomfort. Your brain experiences it like this. How many of you have heard, well, I know you've heard it, the phrase, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me? This research and subsequent research that corroborates this research suggests that phrase is blatantly false. I can hurt you deeply with words, in fact, at times I can hurt you more deeply with words than I can with some physical object. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so why, why, why talk about this? Well, why do we experience pain in the first place? Why does any type of pain, why do we experience pain in the first place? It's an alarm system that says something is wrong. And when the alarm system in the brain goes off, it says something is wrong, the brain mobilizes lots of resources, attentional resources, focus resources, memory resources, uh, and sugar resources. That's energy, that's what your brain runs on, sugar resources, to address the pain. Do you have unlimited amounts of these particular resources? No, so if attention resources, memory resources, uh, focus resources, and sugar resources are being sent to address the pain, you have fewer resources to do what? Anything else to study for an exam, to write a report, to do your tasks at work. Outsiderness has an impact on cognitive and task performance in the same way that it impacts athletes when they're distracted. Okay. Well, why can't you attend to more than one thing at a time? Why can't you attend to pain and something else at the same time? What I'm basically saying is why can't you, students, get this, why can't you multitask? Because you actually cannot multitask the way you think you can multitask. Right? Your brain is not developed, was not developed to do things in parallel. It does things in serial, uh, in succession. Okay? You cannot multitask. And if your brain is trying to address pain, and you can't multitask, you can't address anything else very well. Okay. Just let me just prove you can't multitask. Everybody take your right hand. Everybody take your right hand. Make a circle. Keep on making that circle. While you're making that circle, take your left hand and make a square. You look very stupid right now. <laughs> right? Right? Very hard to do, isn't it? In fact, you're not doing it. This, but this is a task that you can do over and over, and you'll learn how to do it because it's a kind of a motor behavior. It can, it can be you can write a neural script for it, um, and it can run automatically. But 
this is what you can't do. You can't, you can't practice this one. How many of you, in reading a book, studying for an exam, you're reading your textbook, you read in a page, you get down to the bottom of the page, and you go, what did I just read? How many of you ever done that? And then you do this, you go, let me read that again. And for the second time, when you get down to the bottom, you go, what did I just read? Yeah. You were, quote, unquote, reading the words very superficially, not engaging your working memory, and then maybe you were thinking about your stupid boyfriend or girlfriend and what they did to you. That's what you were paying attention to. Okay. So you actually can't multitask. Um, there's an area, there's a region of your brain in the anterior section of the prefrontal cortex that people have labeled Brodman's Area 10, BA10. It appears as if Brodman's uh, Area 10 is chiefly responsible for deciding what you pay attention to, what task you engage in, right? But again, Brodmas Area 10 only makes one decision at a time. It operates in serial fashion, not parallel fashion. Uh, think of Brodmas Area 10 as air traffic control at a single runway airport. How many planes can land at any given time at a single runway airport? One, what happens when multiple planes try to land at one time at a single runway airport? Bad stuff, right? So at an, at, at an airport on a runway, a plane lands at certain interview, intervals every couple of minutes or so. Well, Brabham's Area 10 also makes decisions about what to pay attention to at certain intervals. Uh, research suggests that interval is about 0.7 milli, uh, or seven milliseconds, seven one thousandths of a second, right? That sounds fast, doesn't it? You know how fast it really is? Do you, can you, do you have anything to relate it to to know how fast it is? Okay, so blink your eye. It took you 50, five zero times longer to blink your eye than for seven milliseconds to occur. occur. So what actually was happening when you think you're multitasking um, is you're fast twitching, fast toggling. You're going back and forth very quickly, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Right? If the tasks don't require much of your attention, you can go back and forth very quickly, and it, and it appears as if you're multitasking. But guess what happens when the task require, requires a lot of attention? You don't slow down. You make mistakes. There's a reason why you shouldn't drive and text. <laughs> right? Oh, I have time. Can I have two, two volunteers? I, I want the, uh, the students, because these are the ones that, that people say can multitask. Can I have two volunteers? Two, two volunteers. Come on. We got one? We got two. Come on. Come on down. Right? You, the, does one of you have a phone? Just one. OK, come, come, you, 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 you bring your phone. And while you walk down, uh, well, wait till you get to the bottom of the stairs before you do this. But come on down here. Come on down here. Or actually come up here. Come down, then up here. Right? But the person who has the phone, when you're ready, pull up the stopwatch function on your phone. No, not you. You don't have to. Yep, yep. Your name is? Lori. Lori. Are you, are you a student here? Are you? I'm a student, yeah. you're, How old are you? I am 24. 24. These, these, these are one of the young people who who people say can multitask. Let's see if it's true, okay? And Lori, right? Okay, and your name is? Kathleen. Kathleen, are, you're, are you a student here I too? Am, yeah. You are, okay, and how old are you? 27. 27, all right, okay. Okay, so Kathleen is gonna, gonna be our official timer. Very good, she's got the timer here. Um, Lori is gonna be our official tasker. Okay. And do not worry, Lori, these are very simple tasks, very easy to do, they're, they're in your wheelhouse, so. Yeah, that, 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 that math problem, exactly. <laughs> Very good. All right, so the first task I'm going to have you do, Lori, is uh, say the letters of the English alphabet A through Z as fast as you can. Don't do it methodically. Do it as fast as you can. Just make it understandable, right? Okay. okay? Uh, if you need to sing the letters of the English alphabet, that's fine. That's, that's how we learned it. That's a pattern we have, okay? So uh, uh, Kathy, Kathleen. Kathleen, Kathleen uh, are you ready? When I say start, both of you start. And then when she hits Z, uh, stop and tell me in tenths of a second how fast you did it, okay? On your mark, get set, start. All right, how fast? 4.5 seconds, so 4.6 seconds, very good, very good. Okay, second task I'm going to have you do is count to 26 by 1 as fast as you can, okay? Again, not methodically, do it as fast as you can, just make it understandable. One, one two, three, four, five, all the way to 26, okay. Are you ready? On your mark, get set, start. Oh, 27. That's fine. She, she gets extra credit. Okay. 7.9 seconds. Okay. 
So she did the first task of letters, start and stop in 4.6. Second task, number, start and stop, 7.9. What is 4.6 plus 7.9? 5,000, exactly. 12.5 seconds, very good, very good, Lori. All right, so now what we're gonna have uh, you do is do those same tasks again, but I'm gonna have you simulate what's happening in your brain when you try to multitask. So I'm gonna have you say the letters and the numbers alternately. Okay. A1, B2, C3, okay. D4, so on and so forth, right? All the way to Z26, okay. got that? Yeah. Okay, so understand, well, for all of you out there going, oh, well this is gonna be tough, this is gonna be hard, understand. This, what I'm asking her to do is what's happening when you try to multitask. Let's see how she fares, because that will tell you how you actually fare. Okay? Somewhere along the line, let me point out, somewhere along the line, the letters, uh, uh, maybe E, F, or G, or the numbers 4, 5, 6, or 7, somewhere along there, that combination, um, you're going to notice Lori pause. She's going to lose her place, possibly. Right? Why? It's because, um, like all of us, Lori has limitations in her working memory. She can only hold about seven to nine chunks of data at a time in her working memory. When she pushes a chunk in, she has to push a chunk out and, and often she'll lose her place. She will most likely be able to find her way back, but if she can't help her out, we're her tribe, we gotta have her back, right? So, but allow her to try to get her way back, find her way back first without your help, but if she's pausing for too long, then help her out. Got it? Okay, All right? But just don't, just don't feed her the information though. Just give her a chance to get back if she loses track. Okay, are you ready? Are you reset, Kathleen? Yeah. Okay, on your mark, get set, start. Yeah, 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 very good, very good. Okay, Kathleen, what was the final time tally? One minute, 41.5 seconds. One minute, okay, so 140, 141.5 seconds? Yes. All right. Very good. Okay, go ahead and take a seat and we'll kind of process. Good job, good job. Thanks for helping me up here. Okay. Okay, so notice something here. When she did the first task, the letters started and stopped, 4.6. The numbers started and stopped, 7.9, 12.5 seconds. When she did them alternately, simulated multitasking her head, it took a lot longer almost 12 times as long. This corresponds to every multitasking study that's done that basically says, when you try to multitask with things that require your attention, you're about to 20 to 30% less efficient and you make more mistakes. So when you're reading and texting, trying to study and texting and talk, you don't remember as much or you remember the wrong thing, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, so, uh, and this, this is what it leads to. 
I and mean, this is kind of my final comments before I, I kind of uh, open up for questions. This is what it leads to. Uh, when you try to push your brain beyond things it can do, when you try to operate 24-7, when your brain and body are not designed to operate 24-7, you get into a state that we call cognitive overload. And you know you've been in a state of cognitive overload if you've ever done this. <laughs> what was I just going? What was I just doing? How many of you ever done that? How many of you do that multiple times a day? As seen by the young hands raised, it's not just an old age thing, right? <laughs> See, kind of what's happening is your, 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 your brain gets overloaded. It actually gets overloaded, and your, your brain's flagging. It's going, hey, you got to slow down, slow down. We can't go at this pace. We can't do multiple things at one time. you got to slow down. And if you don't make the choice to slow us down, your brain goes, I'm going to slow us down. So it goes, control, alt, delete. Then <laughs> you blank out and go, oh, crap, we're... So where am I going with all this? Basically, let me just sum it up. When you feel excluded, you, f you feel social pain. Your brain has to address the pain. And because your brain can't address more than one thing at any given moment in time, it can't do anything else like schoolwork or job-related stuff. So it has an impact on performance for yourself and then ultimately the whole organization. Does that make sense? That's just one reason why you should address issues of inclusion and exclusion here. There are many other issues I don't have time to get to, but it has an impact on all of you, right? And then um, I want to leave you with this thought. Diversity is not our problem. Diversity is not our problem. You know what our real problem is? We haven't gotten far on along these diversity issues for the last 40, 50 years because we've been addressing the wrong issue. Any engineers in the room? When you address the wrong issue, you rarely arrive at solutions for the real problem. What, what, how will you hear that as what? Root cause. What is root cause, right? When you address the wrong issue, you rarely arrive at solutions for the real problem. Diversity is, is not a problem. You know what our real problem is? Close-mindedness. I believe we've been addressing the wrong issue. When you invite diversity in the room, differences among people, different races, different genders, different types of degrees, different problem-solving styles, cognitive diversity, when you invite those differences in the room and you have a bunch of closed-minded people, what you usually end up with is the United States Congress. <laughs> or more generally speaking, Diversity plus closed-mindedness, the outcomes are usually misunderstanding, miscommunication, and conflict. But when you invite those very same differences into the room, and you have a bunch of open-minded people, what you usually end up with is possibilities and opportunities, greater innovation, right? But look at this. Use your modern brain look at this. The key factor in both those scenarios is not the diversity of the room. The key factor is whether people in the room are going to be open or closed to the diversity, right? Diversity is an asset to an organization, to a university, to a nation. We waste the asset when more of our people are closed-minded or narrow-minded. We leverage that asset when more of us are open-minded. And by open-minded, I don't mean um, accepting every new thing that comes your way. It doesn't mean uh, being wishy-washy, change your mind all the time. It means what Aristotle meant by this quote. The measure of a wise person is the ability to entertain new ideas without necessarily having to accept them. The open-minded person is an entertainer of multiple perspectives. They are curious about the world. They explore out stuff out there that they don't know yet. And that's what universities are great for. It's a laboratory of that. right? And that's why diversity and inclusion and equity should be pursued here. That's why the president, the administration, and all of you are pursuing it now. It's a great thing to do. Does that make sense? To remind us to be open-minded, we're going to finish this way. Because I want you to be open-minded, to entertain different perspectives, to critically use your modern brain to critically analyze things, right? Just don't jump to a quick conclusion and go 5,000. <laughs> okay. I want you to stand up. Everybody stand up. 
We're going to do this to remind us to be open-minded, to be curious, to be entertainers, right? We're going to repeat the, uh, uh, the preamble to my favorite television series of all time, Star Trek. Any Trekkies, Trekkers in the room? Okay, so good. So we're going to say this together. So I need the Trekkies, the Trekkers to help the people out in the room who may not know it completely. It starts out space, the final frontier. These are the voyages. We're going to use the next generation version because it's more gender inclusive. It ends with no one has gone before instead of no man has gone before, right? Okay. So we're going to say it together. As we say it together, we're going to make the Vulcan greeting sign, the Vulcan peace sign. Everybody do this. If you can't do it with one hand, use your other hand and pry your fingers apart. Look around you, look to your left, look to your right. If somebody's not doing the Vulcan peace sign, take your peace sign and slap them upside the head for me. Okay? So, again, say it together. Don't repeat after me. People know it. Help the other people around you out. Here we go. Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise, its continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no one has gone before. Thank you for your time, everyone. <laughs>